Hey everyone. Hi. Okay, so um, I'm standing off to the side. Um, so, microphone. yes, microphone. Hi. Sherry, you're going to be introduced now. <laughs> Lisa? Please. Sherry is going to introduce you. <laughs> okay, so okay. Lisa is a first time director who worked on this film over several years in her spare time. Uh, the film premiered at Telluride a Film Festival in September 2021 and has proven to be a big smash wherever it has played at festivals and small art house theaters. Wow. And it has a 98% rating on Rotten Tomatoes. Wow. <laughs> Bad for a first film. Uh, and Susan Omer, who I did not give a complete introduction to, um, is retiring after this semester from uh, the uh, Department of Film, Television, and Theater at Notre Dame where she taught classes on Alfred Hitchcock, uh, Walt Disney, Harry Potter, and film and television history. She also got her PhD at NYU, so she knows a thing or two about both filmmaking and automats. Without further ado. Thank you, Sherry. Lisa, it's a pleasure to meet you. We had Hi, a- Sherry, congratulations. <laughs> Yay, Sherry. Absolutely. <laughs> We had a very full house tonight and many people were able to stay behind. And I think they're eager to ask you questions. We have ushers with mics, so we're going to let them go to it. Okay. All right. Let's see, while our ushers are going to you, I could ask a question. Okay. We were uh, reminiscing about um, some of the elements of the film. And we were wondering, what do you think it is about pies? That is my favorite memory of the automat is when Mel Brooks was talking about that coconut custard pie, I was totally with him. And I noticed your production company was a slice of pie. So you're in on this too. What do you think it is about pies? Oh dear. Well, the automat was really, they were known for their coffee and they were really known for their pies and you know whenever i meet somebody that has automat memories usually pie is involved and honestly i think we need like a sociologist to weigh in on what it is about pie i i don't know i sort of had a contest with my friends i needed to very quickly come up with the name of a, a business um, I needed to form an LLC very quickly. And one of my friends came up with a slice of pie productions. And I was like, you got it. I'm taking you to lunch. And, but I, I don't know. I really don't know. Because I, I just, I just, they had so many amazing pies. I, this morning I had cake. I had shot strawberry shortcake for breakfast. I love pies. I think pies are like a thing. Pies have now maybe pies held the weight before of ice cream and cupcakes and donuts. I'm not sure. Maybe like the pie market has become diluted with lots of other <laughs> things. I think you are a sociologist of pies. This makes perfect sense to me. Uh, anybody else have any questions about the research, the stars, anything you'd like to ask Lisa? You can okay. ask me anything. <laughs> we, we feel so fortunate to have you with us. Thank you. All right, question. My question is just, where did your fascination start? How did you get connected? Is it a, a family or what drove this absolutely charming, enchanting documentary? I really... It would make it would make sense if I told you that my family was from New York, but they weren't. We are West Coast people. My mom, well, I mean, we're Midwest and West Coast people because my mom was born and raised in Chicago, and I would spend my winters and summers in Chicago's with my uh, in Chicago with my grandma. And actually, the the film has been very popular in the Midwest, which surprises me. We, I was at the Milwaukee Film Festival last week and I was very surprised to hear from them at the end of the festival, the film has been chosen for the best of fest. So now they're gonna play the film four more times in Milwaukee. And this, 
this sort of thing keeps on happening because there's automat people everywhere. And mm -hmm. I'm guessing, let's do it. Let's show of hands. <laughs> how many of you in the audience ever went to the automat? Okay, so I'm counting maybe 10 people, which is pretty impressive. I'd say you're probably like 25% of the population of your audience right now. So that, <laughs> I mean, that says a lot, you know, we're, we're not in New York right now, but I was a college student. I spent so much time in my school cafeteria. I loved it there. It was such a up place for me where I made a lot of friends. My high school and middle school eating experience was pretty clicky, but I could sit wherever I wanted in my school cafeteria. I was interested in understanding where my school cafeteria came from. So I went to our school library and I did some research there about cafeterias and I discovered the automat. It was either in a book that my, I found on the shelves or an article that I found on microfiche, but really the automat stuck with me. It stood out from all the other cafeterias and I just kept going deeper and deeper. And at a certain point I realized what an amazing place the automat was. And I, I was a 35 millimeter projectionist throughout my you know, college career at the local movie theater. And I was interested in film. And so, you know, the automat and film, I just decided let's try to make a film. And I didn't realize it was going to take this many years. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if I had known what a kind of what I was getting myself into, I don't know that I would have done it, but you know, it, 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 it really, for the first few years, it was really just kind of, I was obsessed and I, it was just, it was a hobby. It, you know, I didn't realize, I never could have guessed what it was going to turn into, what kinds of people it was going to attract that, you know, I'd have a Supreme Court justice, a secretary of state, some of the greatest entertainers of all time. Absolutely. And up there, please. Great film. No, thank you. How did you gain access to those people? The Supreme Court justice, the Colin Powell, the so I'm very proud of this answer. I literally just sent them letters in the mail. <laughs> I, I used Google to find, you know, the address for the U.S. Supreme Court, and I found the fan mail address for Colin Powell, and I, I just wrote to them in the mail. I didn't know for a fact that either of them had gone there, but, you know, I'm I'm smart enough to be able to figure out, you know, they both were from New York of a certain generation and people of a certain generation went to the automat. Everybody went there. It's like Starbucks. It was just, it was everywhere. So I, I wrote them letters and they both sent me back very similar responses. They, they both said, I went to the automat. I loved it, but I don't think I'd have enough to contribute to make it worth your while to come to DC. So I sent them both back letters saying, you know, it would mean a lot to me to be able to interview you. It would have a huge impact for the film. If, even if you just had a couple of sentences to say, and then they both said, okay. And I, I told them both I'm coming and to really lock lock it in, I had to say, I'm coming to interview Ruth Bader Ginsburg. I'm coming to interview Colin Powell. And once each of them knew that I was, that the other one was involved, then they said, okay, fine. <laughs> and so I interviewed him on a Thursday and her on a Friday. And it was that awful week for her when she had, Donald Trump was running for president the first time. And she had come down on him saying, you know, she spoke out against him and then the whole world came in saying it was not her place to weigh in. And so I interviewed her on the Friday of that week and I was just so scared she was going to cancel because she was having the worst media week of all times, really. But um, she didn't cancel. She just kind of changed. She it was just it was so restricted The you know, the her time was so brief. She literally it was the shortest interview. She sat with me for like three and a half minutes. And my mom was not allowed to come in, <laughs> but um, yeah, I just, I feel really lucky. Now Mel Brooks, that is through that, I used that theater I worked at during college, 
uh, a screenwriter came in as a special guest of our theater. We were doing, we were showing a film that he had written, Jaws 3D. And he and I became Facebook friends because I was his hospitality liaison. I was driving him around and he saw my Kickstarter campaign for the Automat pop up into his newsfeed. And so he sent me a Facebook message saying, I can't believe you're making a film about the Automat. It was such an important place for me when I lived in New York. Do you mind if I tell Mel Brooks about your film? I'm having dinner with him tonight. <laughs> and so that's how I got in touch with Mel. And then Mel said, we got to get Carl. So, and then Elliot Gould was also a guest of the theater that I had worked at. So, you know, I just, I, I was really lucky, but I, you know, I had invested, I really, I put a lot of my life and my time into this theater and we had people coming through it. And I, I'm kind of, I'm a little bit eccentric and, you know, it like, it wouldn't, it doesn't phase me like, oh yeah, just send a letter in the mail to Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Like, why not? I, I just also think that snail mail is really the way to get to people these days. Cause we're so inundated with like social media and email. So that it really worked for me, like mail in the mail. Also, I'd love to hear if any of you in the audience have Automat stories. I always love to hear those. So if anyone has a story, please do tell. Okay, we have a question down here while you think of your stories. I don't have a story, but um, I did talk to my mother today. She's 92. She lives in Chicago. Oh. Extremely well cultured, well read. She is way smarter than me. And I told her, oh, I'm seeing a documentary today about a place in New York that everybody went to. Da, da, da. She goes, is that the automatic? She goes, I've been there. And she had the same enthusiasm that, that everybody else had about it. it so just, first of all, I just have to stop you and tell you that the, auto, the, the Jewish Community Center of Chicago is playing the automat in person at the Jewish Community Center on Wednesday, I believe. So that's literally like in two days. So I don't know, maybe you can get her a lift to take her there to the screening. <laughs> That'd be so amazing. Um, I would love to see it with her. Would it ever be on any streaming service? Could I buy yeah. it? Be on Amazon yes. Prime? Yes. So on June 3rd, the film is going to become available in the iTunes store and on different pay-per-view channels. So it's it's kind of you're sort of catching me towards the towards the end of our film festival run. The film premiered in September, and coming from a theater background, it was really important to me. There's this thing called the first window, and a, with during the pandemic, a lot of companies started you know premiering films online, and they stopped. It, it, traditionally speaking, you know the films they first go to the theaters. Now people are a little bit accustomed to getting films online and in theaters at the same time. Me personally, I'm, I really want to keep theaters in business. And I also, I used to work for several different film festivals. I wanted to be exclusive with film festivals and with theaters for several months before going online. But you are starting next month, you can, you know, purchase the film and watch it at home. So yes, you can watch it with your mother. <laughs> why she can go to the Chicago JCC on Wednesday. Well, she may not make it there, okay. but I think it would be great to talk to her because it would be so nostalgic. Everything from that era, not just the auto map, but I think the whole history of, you know, suburbs, you know, what has happened to America, of course. I definitely did not realize when I chose this subject that it was going to... What I... One of the reasons that I think our film is working so well is that it's it's a film about more than just the automat and it it says something more. And I really had no idea when I first started that the automat it meant so much and that we would be able to, you know, do so much with it as a film. But you know, I, I just got really lucky. It I can't think of a, a better subject on a, my next film is actually a romantic comedy. I, um, but at, at this present moment, I can't think of a better topic for a documentary than the automat. I, it just was, it was so good, really. 
will it be up for any awards? So where? You know, is it Oscar documentary? <laughs> what? We think it should be. <laughs> oh, you're so nice. Yes. Well, we're definitely going to, we're eligible for next year's. So I will, I'll start by saying it's, it's a little unusual what we did. We premiered in September of this year without a distributor. We still don't really have a theatrical distributor. I'm the theatrical distributor, but we will be eligible for next year's award cycle and we're going to submit and we're going to do our best. But you know, it's this is a very grassroots film. It, I tried very hard to find, you know, a Netflix or a Hulu, something like that. And but we're doing a really great job independently. Some people have said that we're doing an even better job ourselves than a distributor would have. The film it's it's playing all across North America, and you know, it's. Uh, some people, I, I personally believe this, and some other people have said this, that since before the pandemic, there hasn't been a film independently to have, or sorry, there hasn't been a documentary to have a release like we have independently without a distributor. You know, I, I hired a theatrical booker. We've been, we've been playing local, you know, art house theaters on our own without a distributor. And I think it's really in the spirit of the automat to be watching the film together in person. I really hope, I, I think one of the takeaways from the film is that after all this pandemic social distancing business that we all really come back together, we need these kinds of spaces like the automat, like theaters where we can all, you know, be together. Um, our The world that we live in is becoming increasingly, you know, fragmented and distance and you know social distance is i think the last thing we need from a social perspective i think that the there's a lot to gain from people interacting with each other i, I mean the, the automat was it might have the automats were like a gimmick they weren't the goal of the automat wasn't to separate people the automat, the, like the 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 spirit of the automat is togetherness, is my opinion. Very definitely. Let's see. I think we have a question there. Yes, that was a, a wonderful documentary, and uh, I was really impressed by the quantity of the footage, uh, archival footage, and the photographs that you pulled together. But also the visual quality was extraordinary. The the preservation and the restoration work. So. I wonder if you could say a couple uh, things about that. And then I actually have a little tidbit for you too, but you can uh, answer the question first if, if you'd like. <laughs> okay. So I didn't have experience before with archival research, but I learned that I love doing it. It was really exciting to be able to visit different archives around the country and to reach out to them and see what they had and it's also kind of a benefit of why it took so long to make the film. Archival materials became more available. Archives, over the course of the, the time I was working on the film, they started digitizing their collections. And so it became easier to do research from home. And so I would, by the end of the, the film, I could find things that weren't available at the beginning. So that was one of the benefits. But it, you know, it was sort of a, if you had to like, in the last 10 years of my life, kind of summarize things that I learned that I love that I didn't know before, probably archival research, dogs and camping. <laughs> <laughs> Not necessarily in that <laughs> Okay, you're too so, bit yes, in it. Well, uh, I was doing uh, some research for a book I was working on. Uh, the New York and 1912, 1914 period, and of course the automat was there. And one of the things I came across on the internet was um, a memory of someone. And uh, it's this, that the women who worked there in the cages uh, and handled the nickels all day, the nickels had some um, metallic component, which I guess they don't have anymore. 
but anyway, it would stain their fingers and their hands from coming into contact. So they had these like semi-permanent black fingers from working with them. I didn't know the about that. I don't know if you've ever come across that. I didn't, but lately I've been getting a question during Q and A's about how did the nickels stay shiny? Like, did the banks, <laughs> did the the, the 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 cars come in the morning from the banks to swap out new nickels? And I literally, the horn, I asked the horns this question over the weekend, and they didn't even know. But no, I don't know about dirty nickel, dirty fingers. <laughs> <laughs> For the sequel. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we have a question there. Yes, please. Hi, my name is Alan. Um, I, so I really enjoyed the film. It, what you asked some a great question at the end of the film of where is this? Where is something like the automat happening now? So I wanted to hear more about that from you. If you have thoughts about that, I think the most tangible example would be in cafes, coffee shops not necessarily Starbucks, but any kind of cafe where there's a culture of people hanging around and ideally speaking with one another. But the spirit of the automat to me are these you know, communal places where people interact with one another. So to me, an automat today could be even like a gym class where people they go there and they like to see each other and something wonderful is offered at a good price. It's, you know, um, impossible for the Horn and Hard Art Automat to come back, but I really hope that the film, the, you know, the message of the film, it's a lot, it's a lot of things, but you know, one of them is that how wonderful it is for people to have access to wonderful, innovative things and for businesses to be both you know you can be profitable and generous and innovative i know that there's business classes that are watching this film right now which is really exciting for me but i i really just hope that you know in the future we, we see businesses come about that are you know, creating wonderful things for their customers. There's there's one coffee shop in uh, the near northwest neighborhood of South Bend, which is a very egalitarian place. So this spirit. What's it so, called? Oh, is it called the Loving Cup? No, that's the not Loving Cup. No, local, 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 local cup. Local cup. Local cup. Oh, it's local. <laughs> so the near Northwest neighborhood is, you know, was fairly down and out and it's kind of coming back and they wanted to make a place for people to come. So that's, that's one example. Any other questions? Yes. I just had a couple of comments. The first comment is that the reason the women's figures turn that way is that many people are allergic to nipple. And that's why great uh, necklaces or bracelets that have nickel in them work during the skin care. The second point I wanted to make was that I once went to, and this is within the last 10 years, a place in the theater district of Chicago that had a Chinese based, um, mm -hmm. what I would call an uh, automatic equivalent or a modern day automat. There was one person there who, um, instead of changing money, made sure that you entered your um, your request, your menu or whatever, on a computer. And she would then take your card, your credit card, and swipe it, OK? And then they would have little cubicles, as, as in the automat, that you would get a number. And when your number came up, it would show on the upper part um, that that number of that cubicle had your order in it. And um, so then you would go to that cubicle number, say 30 or whatever, and you'd open the door and there would be your whole order. And then you would take it and you'd go sit down. Um, and it was, uh, you know, obviously there was someone behind the cubicles that would be loading them as the order number would uh, appear on your inner uh, on your computer entry. So that would be the modern day 
kind of equivalent of Latimer. Oh. I'm next to you, I think. Yes. I want to know maybe the chart of Howard Schultz had to leave the picture of the army. How did you find that out? Modeled a lot of the Starbucks operation after the automatic. Okay, so if I'm hearing correctly, the question was, how did I find out about the connection between Howard Schultz and the Automat? Was yes. that the question? Yes. Okay, so the second time that I interviewed Lorraine and Marianne, the authors of the book, The Automat, as we were packing up our equipment from shooting, Marianne said, "You, by the way, you know about Howard Schultz and Starbucks, right? And I... I said, no, what are you talking about? And so she grabbed a book from her bookshelf in her living room, which was where we were filming. And she opened it up to the first page and she showed me. So this was Howard Schultz's, one of his autobiographies. And on the first page of his autobiography, he dedicated it to the automat. And there was a picture on the first page of the automat. And I had no idea. And I was kind of floored because I had been working on this film for several years and I never heard this before. And also I was living in Seattle, which is where, you know, Starbucks is headquartered and Howard lives. So as soon as I heard this, I immediately reached out to Starbucks and Howard. And it was, it was pretty easy because honestly, Seattle is a pretty tight knit Jewish community. So it was, for me, it was pretty easy to get to Howard and I was able to set up an interview right away and he spoke very freely. The interview was a lot longer than what we put in the film, but you know, we didn't, we didn't want it to turn into like the Starbucks show, but for me, it was really exciting that we had a modern day, you know, CEO chairman of the board being able to say the automat was a huge inspiration for me because then, you know, we could, one of the questions I get is, you know, what modern day businesses did the Automat inspire? And when you have, you know, the top executive of one of the largest food and beverage businesses of the world saying the Automat inspired me, it, it, it's important from a historical perspective. And it's important in terms of realizing, you know, the legacy, the massiveness of the Automat. So, whether you like Starbucks or not, it's it's fascinating that he cites it as a point of reference in his own career. Yes, question up there and then down here. Well, just a um, quick footnote on the interest in pies. Uh, having grown up in Pennsylvania, I mean, it was one diner after another for my family. So, I mean, I could give you a litany of diners and of course the first thing you see are these pies spinning around no. and, you, and they, those diners will pack with waiting uh, you know to be seated and so forth but I had a question from putting this together your storyboarding and was it a team approach or did kind of one idea just as you were working on one part of the film another idea pops in your head how how did you go about putting this together and but, um, if there's any interesting details, you'd be interested in hearing. Thanks. Well, I would say that the very initial, this is like the beauty of having documentary editors, because I'd say they're accustomed to receiving a ton of material and kind of ambiguous ideas from their directors. And in the editing room, that's when you really kind of find the story of a, a documentary. My, my editors are really the ones who did most of the storyboarding. I sort of had like a, a diagram that I had sketched out of like, you know, act one, act two, act three. And that was a starting point, but you know, my editors, they had their own systems of how they they worked. And, you know, I would say it was not traditional storyboarding in our case. And that we all, th there was me, my editor, Russ, and my editor, Michael, and we all kind of had our own different systems that ended up, you know, working out. But 
you know, this was my first film. And so I kind of look forward to getting to know storyboarding more. <laughs> now, was someone waiting up there? Yes, and then we'll come to you. Is that right? Someone had the microphone already? And then I promise we'll come to you. Okay. Um, thank you for a beautiful film. That was amazing. Um, I loved your story about writing the letters to uh, Colin Powell and uh, uh, Mrs. Ginsburg. I'm I'm uh, retired sales, and you don't know until you ask. So that's that was perfect. Um, yeah. I love the beauty of the film and seeing the build the Art Deco of the buildings and the beauty that they put into it. I was very it was very heart wrenching for me to know that they were torn down. Um, and I think that that's one thing that hurts or that, that affects me the most in America is that we throw things away instead of trying to preserve them like our European countries. So if you would uh, maybe, if you know anything about kind of why they did that um, and something else, yeah. Even just this weekend, I was in Times Square here in New York and I, peeked my head into the first automat because I usually have always been able to look in there and I could see that the ceiling was still intact with the art deco, you know, details and or terracotta. And for the first time ever, it was gone. I, they've covered it up and they had already removed, there were these brass railings on the staircase that were from the original automat that were gone. Now the ceiling, it's, I really care, I care about the, the preservation, but there's also the reality. And I think that's one of the, the important parts about the film. Like you, we just can't, we can't keep stuff forever, but at least in the, in the film, we can, we can preserve it. I remember the other part of my question. Um, there was the, uh, the gentleman talked about the warehouse of everything that came out. Is there, are there any pieces in a museum that people can go or, uh, you know, I saw you in the antique store. Um, so what's happened with some of the parts that have come out of the buildings? I think Steve has found some homes for some of the things in his barn since, because that was, I filmed, that on the very first day of shooting the film, which was in 2013. And so since then there was an exhibit at the New York Public Library and he provided automats for that. And I think that helped him sell units. I don't know that he sold any units since the film came out, but I think he's down to not, he's got a lot less than he did then. There's a museum in upstate New York. I don't know. I don't, I think it's in Albany and they have an automat unit in the museum. The Smithsonian has the original Chestnut Street Philadelphia automat in their collection. It's in storage right now. Those are the only two museums that I'm aware of that have actual automats in their collections. They're, they're really, they're big, they're heavy. So I, I, I know that there's museums and archives with photographs and other ephemera, but in terms of the machines, them, there's, there's a museum in Philadelphia that has stained glass, but you know, the, the, I can't exactly explain it. I also, I just, it's also just blows my mind that this incredible thing came to an end. And I can't imagine, I have such a hard time getting rid of things. I can't imagine for John, the engineer in the film, for him to have to close down the automats and have to deal with, you know, the aftermath of it, getting rid of the equipment. I can't imagine how, you know, painful that that must have been. The lady in the center there. Thank you so much for this wonderful documentary. I was really touched by the way in which uh, these, the autom uh, the automat, like the Horn and Hard Art um, places became centers uh, or sites for people of very different class positions, as well as ethnicities, uh, races who come together. When did you discover that that was really, well, for me, it was the main thing, but a key theme. 
And then how did you go about pursuing that? It definitely was not immediate because in the beginning I was sort of focused on how glitzy it was and it was just, you know, I thought it was this iconic place, but somewhere along the line, I realized that it, you know, it represented, you know, integration and diversity, not just, you know, gender or race, but also different ethnicities, people from different countries. And I'd say the first person I interviewed who really got to the heart of that was Lisa Keller. She was the, the one who talked about women becoming, you know, very important members of society in New York City and they needed a place to eat. So really, I'd say the, the very first piece of the diversity that I understood was that these were important places for women. And it wasn't just the automat, it was cafeterias in general. But of all the different cafeterias in New York City, the Automat was the one that really, it outlived them all. And I, I really think it was because they had that edge, which was maybe the Gilt Edge coffee, but also they had the, the, the Automat machines that gave them an edge. It set them apart from everybody else. And they, they lasted a very long time. I mean, the company from start to end was almost a hundred years. <laughs> it wasn't mine. <laughs> I think we have time for one more question down here, or if we two, even if we uh, down here, I think. Lisa, could I ask? Also, one? like, if anyone doesn't get their question answered, you are totally welcome to email me at lisa at automatmovie dot com, and I get back to everybody. So this is, it's a super grassroots film and I really appreciate the support of your film festival and all of you for coming here because I, we couldn't do it without you. And if you like the film, I would so greatly appreciate if you would recommend it to somebody else. And we have a full list of all of our upcoming screenings at automatmovie.com. And again, we're going to be available in the iTunes store and on pay-per-view channels starting on June 3rd. Okay, last question there. Uh, thank you. Is it my recollection at the beginning, Joseph Horn went to Europe or was it Germany to buy the machine? Huh. Okay, so one of them, I'm trying to remember, I think it was Frank Hardart who went back to, because he, the hard arts were from Germany, and so he went back to his native Bavaria. I think it was hard art at the moment, but the idea was that this traveling salesman came along and pitched them the idea, and for the proof of concept, he went back to Germany to actually see it. And we didn't include this in the film, but actually the very first Horn and Hard Art Automat that was shipped from Germany, it sank in the Atlantic. And actually the, the crew died on that ship with them. I mean, this is this is the, you know, rumor has it. And then it was the second, second Automat that was shipped that made it and became the first Automat in Philadelphia. What do you know of uh, those machines in Germany? their usage there. I've seen really beautiful pictures of them that I'm trying to remember the name of. Okay, so, ah, so the name of the manufacturer of the very most original automats was Seeloff, S-I-E-L-A-F-F. -F. And I've seen brochures that they had produced in the 1800s to kind of sell their machines. And they were just, they were all across Germany and these cap, these open air automat cafes, they were just beautiful. And I'm trying to remember the name of the archive right now where I, where I found the, the handbook, but mm -hmm. the, the Horn and Hard Art, they imported the first automats, but then, you know, they decided they needed to mass produce them. They decided to make, make their own ones. And that's where they brought in John Fritchie. And, you know, one of the, the joys of this process of distributing the film is that I start hearing from people. And so relatives from the Fritchie family have contacted me. And there's 
there's a million hard arts out there. So when I'm, I'm in person in an audience, like there's a 50, 50 chance that someone's going to raise their hand and say, hi, I'm Lily hard art or something. And, um, it's, it's really nice. And especially with the hard arts, there's a lot of young hard arts. And so whenever one of them is there, their parent will say, oh, I'm so glad that finally our daughter could understand, you know, her family history. And, you know, it's, it's definitely, it's, it's of, you know, national and international significance, but these are also people's lives and it's their family history. And so, um, it's really, you know, I, I stayed with the Horn family a few nights ago. They were having like an important family dinner. It's, it's nice to be, a, I'm, I'm very much like a part of the Horn family now. They're also like the Horn family is really small. You might've noticed that there were more hard arts in the film than Horns. The hard arts actually stayed in the company a generation longer than the Horns did. So, but, you know, it's, I've be like, Def definitely like friendships have been made because of this film that are going to last, you know, the rest of my life. And it feels really good to have, you know, we, we made a film that's, you know, it's really touched people. It's meant a lot to people. And my number one goal with this film was just to bring people joy. And I know we did. And I, you know, I sleep, I wonder, no, I really like, I've been sleeping better lately. So I wonder if that's why. <laughs> well, you brought us joy. So thank you so much, Lisa. We really appreciate it. Thank you for sharing your time with us. We'll say goodnight.